Hello and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week we're going to take an up-close look at the James Webb Space Telescope as the most advanced space-borne telescope ever built by the human race prepares for launch. We're going to talk with Dr. Stephanie Milam from the Goddard Space Flight Center. She is a planetary scientist who's going to be telling us all about how the James Webb Space Telescope is going to change our notion about the planets in our solar system, as well as the rest of the cosmos. And we're also going to hear from fellow scientists answering the question, what excites you most about the James Webb Space Telescope? That's a really hard question to answer, but I will say I'm looking forward to the discoveries that we aren't even expecting, the things that we haven't planned for, the things that we are gonna learn how to observe and understand within the lifetime of this mission. This $10 billion observatory in space promises to open up new worlds literally, in our exploration and understanding of the universe. As tall as a three-story building and as wide as a tennis court, Service. Webb promises revolutionary advances in our understanding of the cosmos. Exploring the universe in visible and infrared light the JWST will explore vast numbers of small, cool stars, which have remained, until now, invisible to human beings. Well, for me, one of the most exciting things about the James Webb Space Telescope is it's going to be able to look at objects in the distant solar system and be able to estimate what their compositions are in a much better way than anything we can do from ground-based studies. Right, So we have these objects that are so distant and so faint that it's very hard to get a good idea of what their compositions are. But James Webb should be able to go after that. They're going to be able to look at wavelengths that we simply can't detect from anything we have on the Earth. And learning what the composition of some of these most distant objects are may really advance our studies of planet formation and how asteroids and comets evolve. Using JWST, astronomers will glimpse back further in time than ever before, exploring the cosmos as it was just 200 million years after the Big Bang, or possibly even further back in time. Great Scott! 1.21 gigahertz, Marty! Examining the universe in infrared light will also allow Webb to peer through dust clouds that obscure astronomers' view of some of the most interesting objects in the sky. Six times larger than Hubble, Webb will see the universe in a way that Hubble never could. The JWST will peer deep inside the atmospheres of alien worlds orbiting distant stars. This study has the very real potential of finding chemical markers of life on other worlds. The impact of this discovery alone would represent a quantum shift in how we view our place in the universe. Webb will provide unprecedented views of the solar system in which we reside. We'll see weather on planets and moons and be able to explore ocean worlds like never before. I am so excited that we have this new instrument high in the sky that will enable us to see our place in the universe better and to reflect on who we are, where we've come from, and where in the future we might be going. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. 
Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. We talk with Dr. Stephanie Milam, planetary scientist at the Goddard Space Flight Center about this, about this exciting future of planetary research. This week for on Astronomy News, the Cosmic Companion, for our special in-depth look at the James Webb Space Telescope, we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Stephanie Milam. She is Deputy Project Scientist for Planetary Science for this wonderful new instrument. Welcome to the show, Stephanie. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so can you give us just a little personal look? What is it that brought you into the James Webb Space Telescope program? I actually am the scientist that has been assigned the daunting task of making sure this extremely sensitive telescope that's looking across the universe at the first stars and galaxies can actually do things in our own solar system. So really big, bright objects like Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, but also things that move really fast across the sky. So like near Earth asteroids and comets. That's fabulous. And so can you just give us a brief look for those? Now, I'm sure by now, nearly everyone has heard of the Webb Telescope, but can you to give us a brief intro into what makes it so special and what makes it a worthy six, first teammate and later successor to, to Hubble? James Webb Space Telescope is extremely special in that it has capabilities that are just unprecedented. We've never had an infrared telescope with the capability uh, that James Webb's going to offer to not only the astrophysics uh, community, but also for planetary scientists, including those looking at planets around other stars and everyone that wants to observe things in our solar system. We have resolutions um, as far as like angular scale or uh, pixel size that's comparable to the Hubble Space Telescope. We have wavelength coverage that gives us access to key molecules uh, that we'll be looking for that are critical for understanding whether or not other planetary bodies or objects with our sol within our solar system or even star forming regions have the same chemical makeup as uh, what we would expect to find for our early solar system. Hmm. And what is it that makes, what is it that we can learn about the cosmos looking in these infrared wavelengths? that we may not see or even know of if we're only able to view visible wavelengths of light? Well, at these wavelengths, we can actually see through different things in the universe and within our galaxy that we haven't been able to see through with optical light. So just the same way clouds or dust in our own atmosphere obscures us from seeing stars or um, even the sun at times, uh, or anything beyond our atmosphere, the same thing happens in space. So there's large clouds of dust and gas that are actually where stars and planets are being born um, to form their own systems. And we haven't been able to see inside of those objects at a way that, or sensitivity that JWST will enable. So we'll really get some detailed insight into, you know, how planets and stars are actually formed what that process is, what the chemistry is, and understand a lot more about the physics and the dynamics of the whole stellar evolutionary process. Hmm. So you're able to bring some of this, you'll be able to bring some of this information about other, about exoplanets, planets around other stars, and learn, use that to learn more about the solar system while also taking the things that you learned 
particularly about the solar system. And we should be able to apply that to exoplanets in some ways, correct? Exactly. So um, there's a lot we don't know about our own solar system. So just in and of itself, it's, it's an interesting experiment to do any study um, with the capabilities of JWST across, uh, across bodies in our, own, in our own solar system. But yes, it's absolutely true. The application to other planetary systems is, is tremendous. Most of the planets that we know exist actually look more like objects in our outer solar system than they do like Earth or Venus. So understanding uh, the ice giants and the gas giants in our solar system gives us a lot of insight into how these bodies um, may or may not be forming within these other planetary systems, but also help us with the characterization and understanding of the objects that we have found um, and, and just get a better sense of what's going on in these other planetary systems. Hmm. And of course, biggest question of all about what might be going on on exoplanets. You know it and I know it. How can Webb help us find life on other worlds? So we're not going to be looking for life itself with, with JWST. What we're going to be looking for is, the, is an atmosphere that's of interest to anybody um, that's compelling enough to say, hey, maybe there's water in this planetary atmosphere because it's close enough to its star that it's warm. It looks like it's terrestrial, um, but it does have an atmosphere. So understanding the composition of any atmosphere of a, of a planetary system or of a planet um, will give us a lot of insight into whether or not it has an equilibrium like chemistry or whether there's some process on that planet causing a disturbance. So you can think of anything as complicated as uh, a dust storms, volcanoes or geologic processing but even something like life can actually throw off the chemistry within an atmosphere. So these are the kinds of things that we're looking for. And when we find them, that gives us the whole new, you know, motivation for the next generation of space telescopes or ground-based telescopes, the large 30 meter telescopes to actually do follow-up studies and really start poking on whether or not there's biologic or geologic processes happening on these bodies. And I would love, that's great. I would love for you to expand on that a little bit if you can. Let's say, you know, it's, you know, five years, seven years after launch, Webb says, hey, hey, look, folks, I, you know, there's this exoplanet out there, lots of methane in the atmosphere, way too much oxygen. You know, obviously, what, what are your next steps? How could Webb or other instruments even be used to, to follow up on, those intriguing wow signals of the 21st century. <laughs> I like that, wow signals. Uh, so JWST will definitely do probably more follow-up studies through the duration of the lifetime of the mission. Um, one, just because we see something that's interesting, it doesn't mean that we're seeing it at a similar evolutionary state as when Earth itself actually had life on it. I mean, if you think about the history of Earth, Life is just such a blink of an eye as far as its lifetime, you know, the lifetime of Earth goes. So if we're looking at planets, some smorgasbord of them across our, our own galaxy, um, chances of us actually seeing this blink or an instance of it, a time of a planet where something like habitability or life could actually exist is, is very, very small. We might be seeing something comparable to an early Earth, maybe during a heavy bombardment kind of an era, or maybe a dead Earth, like something more like Mars, where potentially life may or may not have existed there before, but now it's just completely depleted of, you know, its, it's remnant atmosphere or other processes that could have occurred. So um, we have to really stitch together all the picture of not only the planet itself, but its entire environment, how it's evolved in its own planetary system, and then put that into context with what we know about our own solar system. So doing follow-up studies with other facilities, so at other wavelengths, so we can understand the energetics of the, the planet or its environment, um, doing detailed models where we can really study the chemistry or the atmospheric dynamics, these are things that we do within our own solar system to, just to even try to understand things like 
the great red spot on Jupiter. I mean, there's a lot of things that have to come into that, a lot of data, a lot of observations, and a well, as well as a lot of theory and modeling that comes into play and really helps us try to pull that picture together. It's fabulous. And so what's, what are some of the first mysteries of the solar system that you're going to that you're going to look at? With JWST? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, the first year of science uh, for solar system with JWST is really exciting. Um, we're going to be doing everything that we possibly can in the solar system. So because of the funny shape of the telescope, we can't point towards the inner solar system. So it's sort of limited to, you know, Mars on out. But we will be doing things like near-Earth asteroids, comets, interstellar objects, and one of the most exciting programs that I'm, I'm really intrigued about is we're going to be studying some of these ocean worlds. Uh, so moons around Jupiter and Saturn that we believe have a subsurface ocean. And every once in a while, we've observed these geyser-like uh, plumes of gas that have come from them. So either that's something happening to the subsurface ocean itself, um, or maybe uh, there's some geologic process happening. We don't know, but what we do wanna know is what that ocean is actually made of. Is it briny? Is it, does it have organic molecules or prebiotic molecules in it? And JWST is really gonna give us some insight into what that subsurface ocean may or may not be made of based on just looking at the plumes and characterizing them. But even if we can't see the plume itself, say we don't get lucky enough to actually observe one, um, what we can see is the residue of that plume on the surface. So just like a volcano, you know, will, will basically pour out its lava across the surface of the earth, we can see that lava, even if we don't see an active volcano. Same thing happening in one of these bodies, we might see the evidence or the, you know, residue of one of these subsurface oceans sort of deposited back onto the surface. And we can do further studies on this and hopefully one day actually catch one of the plumes in action. So I think that's going to be really exciting and it's going to be a huge amount of information that we can apply to future missions like the Europa Clipper um, where we're actually going to send a spacecraft to that body and do further studies. So for those may not know much about some of these ocean worlds, and there's, there's a few of them that are really intriguing. Can you just give people a look at some of the places you may be looking, some of the wonders that may be found on some of these minor planets and, and moons? Um, so with JWST, uh, we are planning on looking at Europa and Enceladus. So these are two major moons in Jupiter and Saturn that have, we've actually detected now the evidence of these subsurface oceans. Um, but we're also planning to look at things like Ceres, which is a minor planet in the asteroid belt. Um, we plan on doing lots of studies of objects in the outer solar system, Pluto itself, um, and some of its satellites, as well as some of the other minor planets. But another really intriguing object in our solar system is the moon Titan which is a really large moon around Saturn that has these um, crazy organic lakes, methane, ethane lakes. And it's so intriguing because it has such a dense atmosphere, but it also has this surface with lakes and mountains and um, atmospheric dynamics. You know, it has its own weather system. Um, it's definitely an intriguing place for things like astrobiologists to study. And it is one of our key objects for the first year of science with JWST. And what, what, what is one fact that you love about the James Webb Space Telescope that most people out there might not know? So the one thing that I really, it still just blows my mind having seen the telescope up, up close and personal. It is huge. My heart. <laughs> <laughs> So it is so, so big. I mean, it stands, you know, over two stories high. The sun shields the size of, you know, a tennis court. And the most intriguing thing to me about this whole observatory, as big as it is, as complex as it is, as many parts as there is, um, it actually weighs less than the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. 
So all the innovation that went into lightweighting something so that we could launch a huge space spacecraft, a, a giant telescope with a you know a tennis court attached to it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll just throw a tennis court on there. Yeah, we 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 had to lightweight it. So a lot of innovation, technology, and engineering went into this to make sure that we could actually launch something so big, and that included lightweighting all of our materials, everything from the mirrors to the support structure to the sun shield itself. Um, these were all things we had to really think about and, and get clever ways to, to make things a lot lighter than what they were. That's great. And finally, you know, JWST has gone through a decade or so of development and, you know, and several delays, but such a huge, remarkable instrument and now launch is coming up. How are you feeling now, and when are you going to be able to breathe again? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm excited. Uh, as a scientist, as somebody that has science planned with this telescope, I, am, I can't wait for the discoveries. I can't wait to see my first set of data, um, to watch the first images come in. I'm, I'm, it's like a little kid at a candy store. I can't wait. Um, I think we're going to rewrite the textbooks. This is the next step for discovery of, of man, humankind. You know, we, we always had this question of, are we alone? What's out there? What, what is in space? Um, you know, is there other life? Could there be other life? And this is the next step of discovery for, again, not only astrophysics, but planetary science, exoplanet science, um, extra galactic science. <laughs> uh, so I think we're going to learn a whole lot and it, it's, it's very compelling and I can't wait. I, um, I will admit I am nervous about launch. I am nervous about all the deployments, but I can tell you um, from the project side, watching how many tests that we've gone through just to make sure everything works in the environment that it's going to be in. Um, making sure we know exactly how the performance of the, the, the whole telescope is going to, you know, actually operate even after, you know, being blasted in the space on a rocket um, and shaken and, uh, you know, launched across the solar system. You know, we have a lot of things that are really hard to do for something as large, fragile, delicate, sensitive as a space telescope and um, watching all these tests and how we've worked through problems, how we've thought about problems that could or could not happen and tested for them has been really just a tremendous amount of effort. And it's been such a great part of being on this team and working and watching the engineers and scientists alike uh, resolving problems and, and thinking of the unthinkable. Right. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Stephanie. It was great talking with you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, best of luck to you and love to have you back anytime. Absolutely. That was, and that was Dr. Stephanie Milam, Deputy Project Scientist for Planetary Science at the Goddard Space Flight Center. And go web. This mission is currently scheduled to lift off on the 24th of December, although that could be delayed. Half an hour after, after launch, Webb will separate from its Ariane 5 launch vehicle and deploy its solar array. Two hours after launch, the high-gain antenna on JWST will be deployed. The sun shield and mirror start to unfold six days into the flight. The spacecraft will travel about a million miles from Earth over the course of a month, reaching its final destination in orbit around the sun. Uh, this is also the time when instruments are going to start to come online. The first target for the mighty Webb Telescope will be a cluster of stars 
testing systems on board this next generation observatory. This mission is expected to last between five and a half to 10 years. Now, fuel is needed for Webb to maintain its orbit around the sun. At some point, that fuel is going to run out, which will likely end the mission. The JWST is by far the most advanced telescope ever launched into space. Provided everything works as planned, including successfully unfurling the 18 segments that make up its massive primary mirror, the James Webb Space Telescope will revolutionize our view of the cosmos. Go Webb! If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, check out every other episode at thecosmiccompanion.tv. No, no, I mean it, really. You want to check out every episode I've done? Really, right? Write me and let me know you've done it. Be cool. For more information on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Mm-hmm.